seven and a half day blastocyst in the endometrial wall. Again, we're going to start to see layers form. This diagram gives us a little more information about what we call those layers, but we have the embryo itself, which is an embryonic disc in a sense, and that consists of an epiblast and a hypoblast. And then we have this endometrial epithelium. Now all of this will be some other part as we, as we develop further on down the line. That outer layer, that trophoblast, is going to be what is going to help form the placenta proper. And that is in the endometrial layer forming a whole bunch of blood vessels that are basically the connection between a mammal, mother, and child. So what we have to do is we have to start to organize that endometrial layer and we have to form a blood supply that's going to connect maternal blood supply to developing embryo and eventually fetus blood supply. So about 12 days blastocyst, we start to see something totally different. And we start to see that space that was formed way back when becoming something else. In early development, we then see it called the yolk sac. The yolk sac. Humans have yolks? Where else do I find yolks? Chickens. Hmm, maybe we're related. I don't know. But chickens lay what? Eggs. So they don't have this maternal connection between developing embryo and fetus and mother, correct? So what do you think the yolk sac's for? Take a guess. Exactly. Nutrients for these early cell stages because I don't yet have that organized connection to mother, but I still need nutrients. So this is my sac of nutrients, the yolk sac, that forms from now those early layers to help provide nutrients to that developing embryo at this point. The extra membranonic, membryonic mesoderm, what do you think that's going to be? There's a big huge space here in the extra membryonic coelom. What do you think that might be? What are you floating around in during fetal development? A big sack of water. What's it called? It's called amniotic fluid and in the amniotic sac. So this is where we're going to see that occur. So day 12, we have started the organization of cells in the endometrium to try and form the placenta. Those groups of cells that are working very hard to do that are in the chorionic layer. The chorionic layer can tell us a lot about embryonic development and the genetics of the embryo itself. We can actually sample those cells and look at the genetics of the developing individual because those cells came from that implanted cell. So part of the layer from the original blastocyst is going to form a layer called the chorion. And that's the direct connection to mother. So 16 days into embryonic development, we start to see more highly developed chorion. We start to see an amnion. We start to see a yolk sac. And the amniotic cavity itself isn't out here, is it? It's not in the extra membryonic coelom, is it? It's actually in the blastocyst itself. So the amniotic cavity is here in blue. So what is all this stuff going to be? Hmm. What do you think? Well, when the baby is small, in the four and a half week embryo, we still have a lot of space here. But what do you think is going to happen? As it grows, it's going to take up that space. So the, here is the amniotic cavity surrounding the developing embryo. 
Does that look like a human? Oh, kind of looks like a chicken. You have gill slits at this at this point in your development. Gill slits? What do you need gills for? Hmm. Might be some relationship to some other organisms. I don't know. Just throwing that out there. So if we look at embryonic development and some of the different parts that you have during embryonic development, we see a lot of similarities in other organisms, especially similarities in, in mammals. And give me an example of a mammal. Not just mammals, animals in general. Yeah, elephants are mammals. Whales are mammals. Dolphins are mammals. Dogs are mammals. Um, but we also see a lot of similarities in some other, the other uh, individuals in the animal kingdom. Birds, reptiles, OK? So we see a lot of similarities during embryonic development. And that's actually a whole study in itself called embryology. So four and a half weeks, we start to see a very highly organized group of vascular tissue in the endometrial layer. That chorion, again, plays a big role in developing the connection between mother and child during embryonic development. Why, there's a what? Yep, you have a spinal cord, don't you? That's eventually going to become part of your spinal column and vertebrae. But in your dog, what happens? Same thing, except they're going to have extra what? Your spinal column, we already learned this in the nerve, when we discussed the nervous system, does it end at the bottom? Your spinal cord, does it end at the bottom of your spinal column? No. No, no, no. Where does your spinal cord end? between L1 and L2. So the rest of those vertebrae are just basically holding everything down. Well, some organisms have more vertebrae that go out into their tail region. Some humans are born with tails. Did you know that? Yeah. Well, it's not that unusual to be born with a tail. What do we usually do? He's got a tail. So what do we do with it? Yeah, we, we chop it off and, oh, don't tell anybody. But you'd be surprised how many children are born with tails. And that's not abnormal. Also, another thing that's not, that is actually a dominant trait, not to, I'm talking about something else, is not five fingers. It's six. But why do we all have five fingers? What do you think happened to the first person that was born with six fingers? Yeah, we probably got rid of him. Why? Because what? Yeah, it was devil. It was a devil. Evil. Get rid of him. So actually, six fingers is a dominant trait in humans. But because most of us have five fingers, we tend to see more people with five fingers. Just the way we've developed you know, that hand. Some have three, so it depends. Depends on you know evolution. Yeah, and you saw a lot of similarities between your toes and your fingers, didn't you? Six toes, yeah. That's actually, honestly, it's a genetically a dominant trait. So it's, it's a mutation, and we'll talk about that when we talk about heredity, that your genes that you pass on to the next generation don't always get passed on perfectly. And that's what a mutation is, and that's where changes come from in development. Um, mutations can be detrimental, but mutations can also be beneficial. Mutations happen by mistake. Now, there's some substances that caught, we know cause mutations. What do we call those usually? Because the mutations that they cause usually aren't good ones. Yeah. Tetragenic agents um, or mutagens, that's easier to say. Um, carcinogens, 
are mutagens. Okay? So, but mutations happen all the time. And that's where we get diversity in our species. So we're only about, how old are we? Do you know how old Homo sapiens are? We're like not even a speck on the time scale of the, the Earth. Homo sapien, do you know? 200,000. Thousand. That's baby. We're babies. What, how old is the Earth? Billions. Billion. So think pennies. How many pennies would you rather have? A billion or 200,000? Yeah, I'd rather have a billion. So you are, you are developmentally, evolutionarily, a speck in time as far as this planet goes. So we've had so many, many millions and billions of years for change. Just throwing that out there. Hmm? Yeah. Well, and who came from what? And when that can be a whole huge discussion and take biology too, and we'll discuss that. But um, multicellular organisms have the, have the possibility for many mutations to occur. And that's where we get diversity in, in our organisms. So 13 weeks, we start to see something very familiar to what we're going to see near the end of embryonic development. And this talks about events of embryonic development, the gastrula to the fetus. So that's what this diagram is pulling us through. So four and a half weeks to 13 weeks. And again, it depends on the textbook. Even this textbook just contradicted itself. Before it said 12 weeks, now it says 13 weeks. So I always say, Three months-ish is where we start to call the embryo now the fetus. And why do we call it the fetus? Because now we have the development of what? A very complex what? Placenta connection between mother and developing child. So we look at a closer look at the placenta and we see a very highly vascular system that is going to help exchange nutrients and waste kind of at a capillary level, just like we do in our own bodies from circulatory system to tissue level. But now we're going to be exchanging nutrients and waste into the circulatory system of our developing what? Who's on the other end here? Yeah, the developing fetus. So mother's circulatory system is responsible not only for taking care of herself at this point, but also taking care of the needs as far as respiratory gases, nutrients, and waste removal of the developing fetus as well. And that happens through the placenta. So placenta is very important, yes? Now, this diagram, formation of three primary germ layers, talks about some of the different cells and what they will become in the eventual infant that occurs. So we saw, again, that group of blue cells called the amnion, and that yolk sac, and then what's that bilayered embryonic disc going to be? Any guesses? Yeah, that's, that's your embryo, which will eventually become your fetus. So <clears throat> a little view of the disc as it grows. This is the head end and the tail end of the bilayered embryonic disc, which is then going to start forming different layers, embryonic layers, during embryonic development. And again, those layers will eventually become organ systems. Remember when we talked about the mesoderm and the endoderm and the ectoderm? You've heard those terms before. Okay, those are the different layers that we're going to talk about in this chapter. And here we see them in this portion of the diagram down here. So we have the ectoderm, then we have the mesoderm, 
and then we have the endoderm. So at 16 week, at 16 days, excuse me, we've already developed these three major layers of cells. Again, those are going to go on to develop into different organ systems in the eventual fetus. Oops. Go back. So, again, we see the amniotic cavity, we see the mesoderm, and we see the yolk sac. So the layers are going to start to flatten out, and gastrulation is complete, forming these separate layers, which will then form systems. And a notochord and neural plate, you've heard those terms before as well, haven't you? Are going to start to appear. And when do we have the beginnings of the notochord and neural plate, which is going to be your what? Nervous system, how many days into the process? So 17 days after fertilization, you start to form what? Your nervous system. Is it important for nutrients to get to this developing embryo? Yeah. And maybe not toxic chemicals to be exposed to these cells that are being produced? So it's really important to make sure that you get proper nutrients if you even think that you want to start to start a family. So it's important for you to take care of yourself, especially during these early, early days. 20 days, what do we see? The neural fold begins to fold even more. So we're going to start to see something that starts to look like um, our central nervous system. 22 days, neural fold have closed. So we're going to start to form that cavity that forms what? Think of you as an adult. What did we talk about when we talked about your nervous system? There's two major divisions of it. I'm holding my head to give you a hint. Two major divisions. The central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, and what else? The peripheral nervous system. So we start to see beginnings of the separation between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system cell formation at 22 days. By the end of four weeks, somites have subdivided into a whole bunch of different cells, myotomes, dermatomes, vertebrae, skeletal muscles, dermis, respectively. So this is what these cells will eventually become, these adult systems. And we start to see a body coelom. What's a coelom? What does it look like? I'm giving you a hint. Yeah, exactly, a space. Why do I need a space? What do I have? Think about this stage and then what I'm going to end up with. What do you think those spaces are going to be? Yeah, exactly, organ, body cavities. This one here is the peritoneal cavity. Yes? So that's labeled right in your diagram. So we're going to start to form the cavities, the spaces, which will eventually be filled with, as my cells continue to reproduce, the organs in those spaces. Yes? So we see that at the end of four weeks. So specialization of these layers is what this diagram is going to then talk about. So we have the amnion. We know what that's going to be. And the yolk sac, we know what that's for. And then we have our three layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. So as we go further on, we're going to start to see it fold to form what eventually? Yeah. 
Yeah, the somites that we see through the ectoderm, that's going to be part of what? That's running down the back end. What do you think that's going to be? That's going to be your spinal cord, part of your central nervous system. And that sac, that layers or the layers are going to start to fold in to form a head and a tail region. The yolk sac is still there because the yolk sac still needs to provide what to these cells that are reproducing themselves? Yeah, we're still, we're still relying on the yolk sac for nutrients. We're also going to rely on the yolk sac for the beginnings of our blood cells. So the cells that will eventually become hematopoietic stem cells are going to be found in the yolk sac as well. So as we go further, we start to see the neural tube, the notochord, the gut or digestive system, and foregut. So five-week embryo. We see much more specialization of those layers taking place. So here's your tail. Here's your spinal cord, central nervous system, and what's all this stuff in here? And this is five-week embryo. What are all these tubes from, oh my gosh, they start at the mouth and they end down here someplace? Yeah, that's your digestive system starting up. Um, so we start to see the liver and the pancreas. And the gallbladder, believe it or not, you already have a gallbladder at five weeks old. And you start to see the beginnings of the small and large intestine, the stomach, the lungs. Remember when, and I don't know if everybody got a chance to do this, but you got to pull out all the organs of your fetal pig at the end of dissection. Yes? It was, wasn't very difficult, was it? They kind of all came out together, didn't they? They were sort of all attached to each other. Do you understand why now? Because of the way they develop? They're all sort of attached to each other somehow because they all come from very similar layers. So this is the endodermal differentiation diagram. And again, this is what we see at five weeks. So this diagram Flow chart showing major derivatives of embryonic germ layer. Notice it's different colors. So again, we have the ectoderm, which are, is going to be in what? And you see that throughout the chapter. Let me go back and remind you. What color is the ectoderm? Blue. Okay, so let's go back to the diagram. So the ectoderm, what are those cells that form that layer going to eventually become as the embryo and then fetus develops? So we're going to have epidermis, hair, nails, glands, so your integumentary system, brain and spinal cord, neural crest, so sensory neurons, bones, blood, What's going to happen to the mesoderm? There are going to be some other little organs dotted in there. Kidneys, gonads, dermis of ventral body regions. What's a ventral body region? This part, yes? Walls of the digestive, respiratory tract. Visceral serosa. What's a visceral serosa? Give me two words that describe the visceral serosa. Mesocolon. Mesentery. Those words ring a bell? Where are you, you going to find them? Wrapped around what? the digestive system, okay? Blood vessels. And what's going to happen to the endoderm? It's going to be glands, line things, a digestive tract, respiratory tract. So this is also um, a nice diagram to look at to see what those cells 
will eventually become as we continue through embryonic development. You've seen this before, haven't you? And you already know about it, don't you? From studying your lab, circulatory system, this is fetal circulation. So while the fetus is connected to the mother, the fetus is underwater. Do we have gills? Not anymore. We had some gill slits way back a few weeks ago, but not anymore. So how do we get our respiratory gases? Through our blood, through the circulatory system. But in us, how do we exchange those respiratory gases with our atmosphere? You breathe, yes? Does your fetus breathe? No. So how is it going to get respiratory gases? Yeah, so mom's going to take care of that for me. The placenta is going to take care of that for me. But as I develop, I still have to develop all these parts that I'm going to need when I leave mom. So I have to have all the parts in place in order for me to then be delivered from mom and separated from that placenta and carry on all those functions for myself after birth. So all of those parts are developing, but circulation is a little bit different because I have some major blood vessels that are connected, and this is in all mammals, that are connected to mother during fetal development that are going to take care of some of those major functions for me. So we see um, arteries and veins, or actually arteries associated with the placenta. Um, you should be able to identify those on your fetal pig, right? What, what do we call those arteries? I'll give you a hint. They're in the, aha, the umbilical arteries. And in your fetal pig, where were they? Yeah, they're kind of running beside the bladder. And of course, your fetal pig has been separated from its placenta. But those blood vessels at one time were attached to the placenta and the mother pig. Yeah, they're going to start and feed into the liver here. So see them here? At the ductus venosus, we're going to see them feed into, because we're going to do some filtering in the liver, and then we're going to go through the rest of the circulatory system. So we have to go in, feed all of the tissues, and then come back for exchange with mother in the placenta, right? So there's umbilical veins as well. Umbilical arteries and umbilical veins are necessary for exchange at the placental level. Am I going to need those when I uh, get separated from mom? Yeah. Turn else, they turn into something else, but they're not going to be blood vessels for me anymore. What are they going to be? They're going to be ligaments. And one of the, one of the major ones, the ligamentum teres, is actually going to help anchor down that liver. It, it keeps it attached to the who? You all have one of these. You're a mammal. I'm pointing to it. It's your belly button or your umbilical, where your umbilical cord used to be. And that ligamentum teres kind of is still attached to that region and helps hold all those organs in place for you as an adult or after birth. So we see a few structures. And again, we, we discussed these or should have discussed these. And you should have looked them over when we talked about the circulatory system. Another strange thing we have is a big hole. What's that called? It's called the foramen ovale, and where is that located? The two atria. Between the two atria, why do you think there's a hole there? You don't really need your lungs, but you still have to do what? You still have to send blood to your lungs because that's developing tissue and you need to feed it. But the reason for your four-chambered heart you don't really need it when you are relying on mom for all of that. So you really have a three-chambered heart. Oh, my goodness. Are there any other organisms that have three-chambered hearts? Maybe. 
frogs. Yes, they have three chambered hearts. Just throwing that out there, too. So you have a three chambered heart while you're developing, essentially. You have the chambers there, but they're not really acting as they do when we discussed um, you as an adult. So you as an adult or a newborn are going to then block off that foramen. And it's going to be called what? The foramen ovale in the developing fetus is going to turn into a wall normally. Sometimes that doesn't happen properly, and that can be an issue. But it turns into a wall with a little divot of a wall because it's not as thick as the walls of the original atria that were there. It's called the fossa ovalis. And what happens to that ductus venus? Turns into a ligament. The umbilical vein turns into the ligamentum teres, again, helping everybody stay put down there. And umbilical arteries, they also become ligaments as well. OK? So that's the difference between fetal circulation and newborn or adult circulation. Holy crap, holy, where did that go? So. Events of fetal development um, on page 1088. I love this table because it shows you exactly what you look like. And you look pretty strange at eight weeks, but it goes through the events of, of development during the fetal period. These are neat, neat pictures. Um, umbilical cord, amniotic sac, uh, the yolk sac, which is still present. And this is the beginnings of the placenta, the chorionic villi formation. This is how old? Seven weeks. Can you recognize that as a human? I can. Looks pretty close, seven weeks. Three months, only six millimeters, uh, six centimeters, excuse me, long. How big is that? About that big. Yeah? Two point something per inch to less than three inches. That's you at three months. We see hands. We see digits. We see feet. We see eyes. We see facial features. Yeah, you see the ears. You see the internal organs. And you can see a blood supply flowing through that um, fetus. This is you at, space starts to get pretty tight. Um, late fetus, five months, 19 centimeters long. How big was yonder baby? How big? 19 inches. How many centimeters? 19 divided by two. Or times two. Times 2.4, actually. Anybody have a calculator? Nineteen times 2.4. What do we got? 48.2 centimeters. So five, we, five months, everything's there. Now we just have to do what? grow everything so and we're going to do quite a bit of growing so um, just a just a general understanding of table 28.1 on page 1080 1088 look at all this information you have you have 1088 pages of information in your brain it's amazing so eight weeks 9 to 12 weeks, 13 to 16 weeks, 17 to 20 weeks, and then 21 to 40 weeks before birth. So your relative size obviously gets much, much larger. 
So before conception, and this is what I was talking about when we talked about the female's reproduction reproductive system, and that amazing muscle called the uterus is about that big before conception, and then has the ability to get about that big during your gestation period. Uh, the fundus, that area at the top of the uterus, jams itself right underneath your xiphoid process. Pleasant experience. Yes? Where's your xiphoid process? Point to it. At the bottom of your what? Your sternum. Your uterus is down here. So it's amazing how large that's able to stretch. So the fundus is well above the umbilicus by seven, four months. We're about halfway there. And by nine months, the fundus is under the xiphoid process. This is why you need to love your mother. So anatomical changes that take place during pregnancy and metabolic changes that take place during pregnancy are abundant. Um, hormones. Estrogen from the placenta. And now we're into talking about what? Yeah. So just a quick um, review of some of the metabolic changes. We have hormones like human chorionic and anatropic hormone that's being produced, a bunch of somatomammotropins that are going to help with development of secondary organs responsible for all of this whole thing, which is what in the females? All of those other organs we talked about with respect to females' reproductive system beside the ovaries and the uterus and the cervix and the vagina. Yeah, those other things, the, the breasts as well. And those need developing during this time as well because what are they responsible for when child is born? Milk production. So we're going to see some changes that are going to stimulate um, milk production. Gastro and some of the physiological changes you will go through during that 40-week magical period. Gastrointestinal system. And all of these changes happen because of the size, basically, of that uterus. Kind of does what to all the rest of the organs in the abdominal pelvic cavity? Kind of moves everybody aside. So you're going to get a lot of gastrointestinal changes. Some women react very adversely to some of the hormonal changes. It can cause them to have what? Yeah, they call it morning sickness, but for some women it's all day sickness, nighttime sickness, in the afternoon sickness. So it can affect your gastrointestinal tract a little bit adversely. Nausea are some of the side effects. Uh, the other thing is that wonderful child as it's growing and pushing up on everything might cause acid reflux to occur. And you might get some agita. You know what that is? Heartburn. That's Italian. So heartburn as well. So we might develop some symptoms of reflux during pregnancy because of everybody moving to the side. And then because of everybody moving to the side and kind of getting squished, we might inhibit some of the peristalsis that goes on in the lower digestive tract. And that might cause us to experience constipation. And remember what I said about constipation and that tissue around the anus? Do you remember what that tissue was called? Came with an H. Hemorrhoidal tissue, which might become inflamed during the constipation period. So what might you also develop? Hemorrhoids. The urinary system. Now we're doing double duty. Yes? Yes. Yeah, and sometimes the blood vessels will burst depending on the degree of the, the hemorrhoid formation. So it depends on how, how much of that tissue is affected. Um, respiratory, uh, urinary system. We're doing double duty now. So we're not only filtering our own waste, but who else are we filtering? developing fetus waste as well. 
So you have to be very, very careful that you monitor kidney function and make sure it can keep up with the extra work. Respiratory system. What are you doing? You're breathing for two now. So again, respiratory system has to do double duty as well, especially near the end of the pregnancy because everything is moving up and squishing that thoracic cavity might have trouble um, with breathing as well. Cardiovascular system. You just developed a whole lot more what? Blood vessels, exactly. So you have a lot more blood vessels trying to, again, provide nutrients and waste and respiratory gas um, exchange for the developing fetus. So that can put, put a toll on your cardiovascular system as well. Some women develop problems with blood pressure issues near the end of their pregnancy due to the overtaxing of your cardiovascular system. Um, and problems with blood pressure. Uh, they talk about eclampsia, pre-eclampsia, problems with what? Blood pressure. What's a hypertensive person? Hypertensive is another way of saying what? High blood pressure. So we can have problems with that as well. Okay, parturition, we're getting to the end. Birth. So, gestational diabetes can be an issue with um, hormone production. It can be an issue with the renal system, because again, we're taxing the renal system. And it can be an issue with cardiovascular system as well. gestational diabetes, what do you have in your blood supply in excess if you have gestational glucose? So glucose is fuel. The more fuel I get, the more cell division I can undergo, and it can go faster. Yay! So babies tend to get really big because they have more nutrients. So it's a combination of all those things that can cause gestational diabetes to occur. Usually, if it's just gestational diabetes, once your systems kick in, um, they're able to get back to normal after that. Um, sometimes it's, it pushes you into type 2 diabetes when you're already predisposed to that. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so let's talk about birth. Now, you're going to get to a certain size, and then mother system's going to say, it's time for you to leave. So we talked about this way, way, way back when, when we talked about positive and negative feedback systems. You remember that? Mm. So let's, re let's dust off the brain cells and talk about the initiation of this process the stretch of that uterus, and it's different for all women, will get to a certain point. And once it hits that point, it's going to be the stimulus for a loop. And the loop is going to include what? Hormones that are going to be produced and released. And what's oxytocin? You know that because you already studied the endocrine system. Who makes it? The hypothalamus. It's stored in the posterior pituitary gland. Very good. So estrogens from the placenta will reach a certain level because of that stretch. And then they're going to initiate this whole process happening. The release of oxytocin. So, when oxytocin is then released, it's going to start what? It's going to start stimulating the contractions of the uterus. Now, watch this. This is how it works, my friends. This, pay close attention to that. 
has to come out here. Okay? Another reason why you need to love your mother. So that has to come out here. And how am I going to get this out? Squeeze. So contract, relax. Contract, relax. Every time it relaxes, what happens? Get sucked back a little. And contract, push it forward, get sucked back a little. Yes? So, You work on that for us. We'll be happy. <laughs> so that's how you're born. So stimulate the uterus to contract. And of course, it can't keep contracting. It's got to relax and then contract again. And stimulate the placenta to make some prostaglandins. And what's that going to do? Start the separation process between your blood supply and baby's blood supply. So they talk about some of the different stages, and this is the initiation of the process. That's when you start going into what? And they call it that for a reason. Those of you who have been through labor know it's a lot of what? It's a lot of work. It is very difficult work, but worth it in the end. See, the, the baby should have been there, so I said, you can look at the cute baby. But, um, I guess he's crying, so he's in the hall. So, um, prostaglandins and oxytocin are going to help initiate this. We're also going to release another hormone to help get that head through that hole, which is where? Think bones. Yeah, you have your coxal bones. Remember the coxal bones? And you have your pelvic brim. Women have bigger pelvic brims, so what? That can pass through. But what else, what do I have to do to allow that to pass through to those bones? Yeah, I have to, I have to kind of relax their hold on each other a little bit. So I'm also going to produce a hormone called, and I don't know why they call it this because there's no relaxing going on. It's called relaxin, which is going to help loosen up what? What held those two bones together? Yep, the pubic symphysis in the front. And what kind of cartilage is that? Fibrocartilage. And there's also some fibrocartilage that's going to help hold it together back there at that other little bone in the back. What's that called? Sacrum. Coccyx is at the bottom. Oops. Sometimes big head breaks coccyx. And that might be another drawback to the whole birthing process. But um, those uh, fibrocartilages, huh? Fibrocartilages loosen up a bit. Now, what you want is baby's little smushy face, see, to be at the sacrum. That's the right position. Because that doesn't always happen. Instead of baby's smushy face being there, baby's really hard cranium is there. Has anybody ever gone through back labor? Yeah, because the kid's not facing. And usually it's boys. <laughs> <sighs> Sorry, guys, but you don't you want to go in the right way even right from the beginning. <laughs> Can't stop and ask for directions. No! So, um... That's back labor. So, stages of birth. First, we have the dilation stage. So when we start those contractions, the cervix, which is normally nice and what? Closed up. And why do I close that up? Yeah, to prevent things from crawling up that vaginal canal and infecting that child during the process. So after fertilization implantation, we form something called a mucus plug. And that kind of plugs that area off so that fetal development can take place and decrease the amount of uh, chance for any infection from the outside world. So in the beginning, what are we, what's going to happen to that plug? That's going to pop. We're going to start to dilate. So stage one is the dilation stage. Six to 12 hours or more. 
The dilation stage is the long part of labor. Um, and once we've reached full dilation, which is about what? 10 centimeters. And they'll be, they'll be nice about telling you how many centimeters you're dilated to, which is also a comforting thing during labor. It's like, I don't want to know. I don't care. Just get it out. Yeah. Yeah. Hurry up. But again, the whole time the uterus is contracting and trying to push that little guy or little girl out. So once we reach full dilation, we're into the ex what? expulsion stage. And that can happen very quickly, or it can take several hours to occur. So dilation stage, early into the whole labor process. Again, we see the cervix is pretty tight. And then we go into the dilation stage late, where the cervix is now open. And what's happening to that big head? It's starting to fall down into the birthing canal, into the vaginal region. Um, here's your pubic symphysis. Here's your sacrum. Again, smushy face on sacrum is good. Big fat cranium on sacrum, not so good. So there can be some problems, depending on the position. Also, baby should be pointing what? Yeah. Head down. How come? Yeah, that's the biggest part. Once that comes out of the birth canal, everything just falls right out. But what if I'm feet first? Yeah, it's gonna, it might get stuck on all of those parts coming out. You know, you get your coxal bones in the way and everything else. That's called breach. So we have to be very careful. Um, that you're in the proper, the baby's in the proper position for the birthing process. And then the expulsion stage where baby's head then comes out and then, well, guess what, ladies? It's not over yet. After the baby comes out, then what do you have to do? They don't tell you this in birthing class. You think baby's out, good, I'm done. No, no. But the stimulus is gone from this positive feedback mechanism, yes? And what was being produced that whole time and how many hours? I don't know. For some of us, we get lucky, but like 12 hours, 10 hours, you're producing oxytocin the whole time, keeping that uterus contracting. Well, once the baby's been delivered, you still have quite a bit of what in your system? So guess what you're still going to keep doing? contracting that uterus. That actually works out pretty well for you because the contraction or the continual traction, contraction of the uterus after baby has been delivered or expulsion has occurred is it's going to help you deliver what? The placenta. So the whole time during the whole delivery or labor and delivery process, that placenta has been slowly kind of pulling its way off of the uterine wall. So the end of the birthing process involves the delivery of the placenta as well. So, <laughs> love your mother. So, everybody good? That's the placental stage. They talk about something called an APGAR score where they actually look at um, things that are going to relate to circulation and respiratory system in the baby. Um, they talk about lactation. So again, during this whole process, you are preparing the mammary glands to produce what? Milk. And this diagram shows us milk production and positive feedback mechanisms of milk reflex, or what we refer to it sometimes as letdown. Yeah, no, that's later. Okay, and you, my friends, have learned everything there is to know about pregnancy and human development. And we will start next week with heredity, the last chapter in your anatomy book. Um, one second.